thank you for that, that great introduction and, and that warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here with you folks tonight to talk about the architecture of understanding. And I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I will um, just give you a kind of a brief, my version of, of my background briefly, uh, and then we'll dive right in. Uh, I have tweeted a link to, this, to these slides, uh, so uh, if you want to kind of feel a little bit less, less of a need to take notes, uh, this, the slides are there for you later. So my academic background is in library and information science. I'm one of those crazy librarians who fell in love with the internet in the early 1990s. So most of my career has been spent outside the walls of the traditional library helping a wide variety of organizations of all shapes and sizes with their information architecture and user experience challenges. Along the way, as you know, I've written a number of animal books <laughs> about polar bears and lemurs and butterflies. Um, and then there's my most recent creation, Intertwingled, which is a book about everything or to be more precise, it's, it's a book about how everything is connected from code to culture. And it's organized into five chapters, um, nature, categories, connections, culture, and limits. And so is this talk. Now, before we dive in, I'd like to um, explain why I wrote this book in the first place. You see, a number of experiences in recent years had convinced me that while I believe that the information architecture of the polar bear book is more important and in many, many ways more difficult than ever before, it's, it's simply not enough. As the web becomes more intertwingled with the work um, that we do uh, in, across physical and digital channels, we need to go deeper. We need to dig into difficult, messy issues like culture and governance. So that's why I wrote the book. And let me kind of tell, tell you about a few of these experiences that, that kind of convinced me we need to go deeper. Um, one was, was working uh, with Macy's.com out in San Francisco a few years back. And walking down the hall with our client. And he said, you know, we've, I've been here for quite some time. And, Every few years, we, we bring in some consultants to help us tidy up our mess, to clean up our website. And, and you know, they, they do a good job, but as soon as they leave, we start to mess it up all over again. Right? Well, this kind of bothered me because it's not my goal in life uh, to uh, make superficial, you know, uh, changes that are, that are ephemeral. I want to make lasting, sustainable change. Right? So, it, to me, this kind of, you know, kind of raise the challenge. How do we kind of, you know, I don't want to skate along the surface, right? How do we get through some of those cracks in the ice and go deep? Had a similar experience. I worked for a few years with the Library of Congress. And the length of the relationship is kind of surprising because it got off to a rather rocky start. I was, uh, I was asked to, to do an evaluation of the library's web presence. So I did my, you know, I did my user research, did my stakeholder interviews, and I started to take a look at the library's websites, which proved to be a lot more difficult than you might expect because the Library of Congress had over 100 websites, all with different look and feel, different brand, identity, search and navigation systems, and of course, users had absolutely no idea which site to visit for which purpose. So I wrote up a report and I was brutally honest. I compared the Library of Congress's web presence to the Winchester Mystery House. Uh -oh. It's a well-known California mansion. Uh, it's in the uh, San Jose area. If you ever get a chance, I highly recommend a visit. It's one of the best tours I've ever had. Um, but the story of the house is that the widow who lived there had been told by a psychic that when the house was complete, she would die. And so she kept adding room after room after room for 38 years. Right? So by the end, there were hundreds and hundreds of rooms and staircases and doorways and windows um, and no blueprint. 
Now, when you visit, you find it's not an unattractive house, and the, the, view, the, the view from any individual room is not unusual, but it's a findability nightmare. Right? It, you, it's very easy to get lost. And I argued this is the, the sort of the perfect metaphor for the Library of Congress's web presence. So I wrote my report. I flew out to DC to, uh, to sort of have a series of meetings throughout the day with um, all the major departments of the library. Um, but upon arrival at the library, I was told that I would not be having a series of meetings because the report had been embargoed. <laughs> it had been deemed as too, it was going to upset too many people. So I, I did have a meeting with the chief information officer, and she said, you know, Peter, we, we agree with you, right? It, but, but we're going to upset people. It's not the right time. We've got to kind of keep the lid on this. So you know, naturally, I was disappointed. I went back to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I continued to work with the library on small projects, but I was frustrated. Right? Um, we'd, we'd sort of seen this big problem, but we didn't have a path to a solution. Well. Over the next several months, apparently this report percolated through the black market of the Library of Congress and uh, eventually made its way to the executive committee, um, where at the highest level they decided we need to change how we work on the web. And they formed a web governance board um, uh, with representatives from all of those major units. And they said, why don't we get that guy, Peter, who uh, pointed out all the problems to come back and see if he can help solve them. And, so that was where uh, I, I had the opportunity to really uh, engage uh, in, in a kind of a rethinking of, of the library's web presence. And, and we made some real progress. I'm proud of the work that we did together over the period of about a year and a half, but we didn't go as far as I would have liked. And to understand why we didn't go further than we did, it's helpful to look through a different lens, right? the lens of the org chart in this case. So, when I was first brought into the library, um, I was brought in by a, a middle manager. Right? And from that vantage point, we could see the problem, but we couldn't solve the problem. We didn't have the authority to push forward. Now, when the library formed the Web Governance Board and they appointed the chief of staff of the whole library um, as the chair of that board, we then had the authority. Right? So the governance model um, was worked out. We had the authority to push forward, and we were able to affect change with that senior leadership support. But there was still a problem. Right? Look at all the boxes on that org chart. Right? And within each of those boxes are many people. You're talking about a, a massive organization with an entrenched culture. Right? And culture is very hard to change. So that's why we didn't go further than we would have liked, because uh, we weren't able to affect the changes to culture that would have been necessary to move more quickly. Right? So again, we've got to dig deep into these issues of governance and culture, and it's not easy. One more story. So last fall, um, I was working with a database vendor on their flagship database product. This is a product that generates over 100 and $20 million a year of revenue. And this is my picture of the product. Um, very powerful, many, many features and capabilities. Almost impossible to use, right? So complex. Well, the president of the organization, he was, he was new to the organization, and he had come in to affect change. And it was his argument that if we don't make this product radically easier to use, uh, within the next couple of years, we're going to be out of business. Right? The world is changing very quickly. And so he made the argument, I want this product to be so easy to use, someone can come in off the street and use it. So that was kind of our, our task. Well, it took weeks of digging through this product to kind of even understand what is this thing? Right? What can it do? And so we kind of dug down into, into complexity, and we came out on the other side with a kind of a simple model of what it could be and how it could work in a way that would, would be powerful but easy to use and understand. And so we fleshed out this idea, and we created some wireframes and sketches and diagrams, and we went back and we, we sort of 
pitched this idea to the executive committee and I could tell during the presentation that the president was, he was visibly disappointed, right? And he was too polite to say anything, but there was something not quite right. Um, I learned the next day from some of his colleagues, uh, they said, don't worry, we've got him on board now. We've kind of explained things to him and, and, and we're, we're good to move forward. But he was upset because he thought it was too simple. Okay? Um, this is part of the challenge. Even when people say, I want it to be simple, I want it to be easy, uh, they have a hard time um, actually moving in that direction. There's a book that came out earlier this year called The Simplicity Cycle by Dan Ward that, that kind of explains how, this, how this, this works. So he argues that with any new product or service or organization, when you're getting started, adding features, adding capabilities increases the goodness, right? You add, you add a feature that people need and it gets better. And you get rewarded for that and you keep doing it. And over the period of months and years, you have this cycle of add a feature, add a capability, get rewarded, keep going. But at a certain point, you hit an inflection point where adding features, adding capabilities decreases goodness because now it's getting too hard to use. There's too much. People are missing things. They don't understand what they're doing. They're getting lost. It's not always easy to know when you hit that point. And it's very hard to change direction. Right? When you have an organization that has been rewar rewarding people and rewarding teams for adding features uh, to kind of shift direction and say, we need to simplify, we need to take things away, is a lot harder than it sounds. But that's the work that we need to do. And I kind of view the work that I do as, as, as kind of taking organizations on this kind of U-shaped journey of understanding, starting with a simplistic form of simple, digging down into complexity, getting into the messiness of, this, of, the, of the ecosystem, and coming out on the other side with an elegant form of simple. Now part of the trick is that to an outsider, it's not easy to tell the difference between simplistic and elegant, right? They both just look simple. So this can't be a solo journey. We need to bring our clients and colleagues along so they actually understand uh, the difference between simplistic and elegant. So that's enough with the stories for now. Um, chapter one, nature, where there's often more than meets the eye. So we're all familiar with the story of the ship that hit an iceberg. It's a story that continues to resonate in our culture because it's not only ships that have a hard time changing course. It's hard to change the direction of an organization. It's remarkably hard to change software. Right? That's why we're all still using uh, this, this clumsy application called iTunes. <laughs> Right? That does all sorts of things that has nothing to do with music. Now, one response to the, 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 the resistance of software to change is to embrace agile and lean methods, right? to kind of uh, embrace minimal viable products, to build, measure, learn, and keep ch iterating and changing, to fail fast and, and learn. And, there's a lot of value in those methods and those perspectives, but I worry that the pendulum may swing too far and at the expense of planning. Right? Let me kind of explain that with a story. So I guess a couple of years back now, um, I went hiking and backpacking and camping on Isle Royale National Park. That's a beautiful rugged island in the, the northwest corner of Lake Superior. This was my first time in my life doing real, like, you know, carrying my home on my back, right? Living in the wilderness for a few days. Um, and it's, it's sort of interesting to note the fuzzy line between inspiration and planning, right? I, at the time I was reading these great books uh, about hiking the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail, and, and I was feeling really inspired, right? But at the same time I was thinking, these people are crazy, right? I would never do that. And the next day, I, was, I found myself buying a tent. So I did a lot of traditional planning, right? I made a list and I checked it twice. 
but I also did a lot of playing and practicing. And I would argue that those are an integral part of planning. So with that, I, I, in the backyard, I practiced with that little kind of uh, miniature stove. And, it, and I actually burned my fingers at first. And I had to learn to use foil to protect the flame from the wind. And in the bathtub, I practiced with this water filter. Um, you do not want to drink that water without filtering it. Um, and so I say to those folks who talk about the, the wonders of, of failure, right? Um, it's all fun and games until someone gets a larval cyst in their brain, right? Sometimes failure has serious lasting consequences. So to the extent we can plan our way around that, that can be a good thing. The real point is that we need to reject the false dichotomy of planning versus building. Right? Planning and building and thinking and doing are all part of the same process of creation. And we, just, we simply need to find the right mix, the right balance, given a particular context. Now, I was, I was drawn to Isle Royale. Um, at first by the story of its ecosystem. Its wolves and its moose are the subjects of the longest continuous study of prey-predator relations in the history of the world. And at first, scientists expected their populations to rise and fall predictably, right, to maintain the balance of nature. But having the ability to kind of watch these populations over the period of multiple decades that's not what happened at all. Their populations rose and crashed completely unpredictably due to exogenous changes, or sorry, exogenous forces, right, but, right, changes that came from outside their model of the system. Things like weather and disease. So in short, their model was wrong. Right? They didn't really understand their ecosystem. And I would argue neither do we. Right? Our models and our metrics that we use within our organizations are too simple. They're simplistic. And they break very easily. So again, we need to go deeper. We need to expand our circle. Fortunately, um, there's a whole discipline of systems thinking where a lot of very smart folks have explored how what, how can we understand and map complex adaptive systems? And they've developed tools, a visual language for mapping the relationships uh, and the flows uh, within those systems. Now, these maps are a necessary step in, you know, in moving towards an understanding of an ecosystem. But they're not sufficient. Right? We have to go further. Right? For one thing, these are too complex for most audiences. Right? Um, and so we need, to, we need to then look for the levers. Where are the points of leverage where we can affect change without getting everyone to understand the whole system? And that is an act of architecture. Right? Um, there's a wonderful book called The Art of Systems Architecting that really looks at this, this idea of architecture across all sorts of systems. The folks who wrote this are, are sort of naval and aeronautical engineers, build giant ships and jet airplanes. And they argue that there's a, there's a dimension to that work that is not design and is not engineering, but is architecture. And they focus in on this responsibility of the architect to know and concentrate on the critical few details and interfaces that really matter. Right? So again, to look for the levers. So to wrap up chapter one, when I first graduated from library school, I knew that I wanted to focus on the design and management of information systems. And that's still a reasonable way of framing the work that I do. But I have realized that I also need to work at understanding the nature of information in systems. That's a much messier, more difficult challenge. And you could look at this as a shift between viewing the organization as a machine, right, the kind of the industrial age model, and viewing the organization as an ecosystem. So 
Time for a quiz. Um, anybody, uh, raise your hand if you can tell me what these two photographs have in common. And there's no wrong answer, but there is a right one. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Uh, very delicate. OK, that's not wrong. <laughs> oh, you're just. Yeah? Sky. Sky? Okay, yep, that's not wrong. Does this have like a central variable that keeps them in balance? Central variable, okay, you're getting closer, right? So the, the brick at the top of an arch is called the keystone, right? And you remove that stone and the whole arch collapses. In the lower picture, we have a keystone species. Right? You remove the keystone species and the ecosystem collapses. Right? So the keystones are often, often a little bit invisible. They're, they're always more important than we know. We'll come back to that idea. While I'm quizzing you, um, we're going to start talking about categories. So here's a category question. How many folks, please raise your hand, if you would self-identify as an introvert? And I'll put my hand up because I definitely am. Quite a few. OK, that's even more than many library conferences I go to. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Um, how many people would self-identify as an extrovert? OK, OK. How many people haven't raised their hand yet? <laughs> Curious? A few, OK, OK. Um, questions around kind of, you know, I, you know, categorizing people, right? Self-identifying as a member of a group or a class or what have you. Right? There's, there's often value there, but there's also risk, and, and it makes us uncomfortable, and there are problems that it raises. Um, there's a wonderful book called uh, Sorting Things Out, Classification and Its Consequences, in which the authors argue classification is dangerous, but not bad. And I've always liked that phrasing, dangerous, but not bad. So whenever we talk about categories and classification, we have to recognize that uh, a, a classification scheme is, is you know, like any map. Right? It hides more than it reveals. Now, everyone knows that information architects uh, do a lot of work with categories. We design navigation systems and taxonomies. Um, we think hard about what sample subcategories to surface on a home page both from the perspective of user experience, right, helping people find what they're looking for uh, and understand where they are, but also from, from different perspectives, um, like search engine optimization, right, um, kind of helping Google to figure out what's here and, 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 and understand what's, what's most important. So information architects work with categories all the time, but I would argue that our work doesn't go nearly deep enough because categories are the cornerstones of cognition and culture. They shape what we believe and how we behave more than we know. Now, our default is the bounded set. Right? Uh, there's a clear boundary. Things are either in or out. You're with us or with them. We use it because it's simple, but that's also precisely why it fails. In fact, most categories are fuzzy. Uh, there's a center and a periphery, but there is no clear boundary. There are no clear set of rules of what's in and what's out. And then there's this notion of centered sets. This is an idea that was invented by Paul Hebert in the 1970s. He was a missionary in India, and he was frustrated with Christianity's traditional rules of inclusion and exclusion. And so he argued for this model, which focuses more on direction than location. Right? So he, his, in his view, a Christian was anyone who's moving towards Christ. It was a more dynamic, inclusive model. And it's an inspiration uh, to us to think more creatively about classification. There's not one way to classify. Now, there's a wonderful scene in the life of Pi, where young Pi is told 
that he cannot be a Hindu, a Muslim, and a Christian. It's impossible. He must choose. And so Pai responds, but, but Gandhi said all religions are true. I just want to love God. Sometimes we must choose, right? but not always. And yet all too often, we use radio buttons when checkboxes or sliders would actually reveal the truth. And we do this to our users, and we do it to ourselves. Okay, so let's go to chapter three, connections. In space, but also in time. So back in the day, back in the early 1990s, information architects used hyperlinks to connect pages to make websites. Right? Things were simple. Then with the, the kind of growth of uh, mobile, social, of cross-channel user experiences, we, we realized that we needed to embrace a more medium independent definition of what we do. Right? We make paths and places across physical and digital spaces. Of course, our work has always operated on a deeper level because the categories and connections we make in the world change our minds, whether we want that to happen or not. Most of our work has been spatial, and yet I would argue that we also need to think more about the consequences of our actions across time. How do we map in that, in that dimension? It's important because, as John Gall would remind us, the system always kicks back. If you're trying to affect change in an organization, the way that you know you're succeeding is that you get a knife in your back. Right? The system always kicks back. So how do we anticipate the consequences of our actions? How do we plan for different possibilities? Now, in case you haven't been paying attention, part of what I'm arguing here is that information architecture has changed since the polar bear. Uh, it's gotten deeper, it's gotten broader. We're able to look at this topic through many different uh, lens. Uh, I can't not mention we've got the author uh, here, uh, Abby Covert, of How to Make Sense of Any Mess. Uh, which is an awesome information architecture book. If you haven't read it, you should. And then get buy a copy for your kid, too. <laughs> um, one of the most important things that we've learned is the importance of understanding context. Right? And one of the best ways to do that right, is to dig into the culture right, by using ethnography. Um, I, I, I've argued this book, The Ethnographic Interview by James Spradley, is, is required reading for anyone in the user experience world because it's a wonderfully detailed, precise kind of explanation of how do you ask the right questions in the right way <coughs> to get to the, the underlying truths, the real things that are going on, going, going on within a culture. And I believe that we need to practice ethnography not only with our users but also with our stakeholders. We need to go deeper into understanding their culture because a successful product or service is going to have a bicultural fit, right? But users and stakeholders. So speaking of culture, chapter four. Culture is like water to a fish. Right? It's nearly ubiquitous. Um, surrounding, um, enveloping, and, and almost invisible. Fortunately, uh, Edgar Schein, uh, one of the experts on the, uh, on the subject, gives us a map, right? a way to, to start to tease apart what are some of the elements or layers of a culture. And he argues that at the surface level, we have artifacts, visible organizational structures and processes. So we can walk into any organization and we can see what are people wearing, right? Uh, what's, what's the furniture like? What's on the walls? Uh, what do people have for lunch? How do they interact in meetings? There's a lot we can learn just from pure observation. We can see what's happening, but we don't necessarily know why. 
to, to get to that next level, we need to dig into espoused values and we need to talk to people. We need to ask them why. And we can learn a lot from those conversations, but we can't learn everything. In part because they don't want to tell us everything. And in part because they don't know themselves. Right? There's a lot of stuff that, that, is, that is going on that people uh, haven't made explicit in their own minds. So then we need to go a layer deeper. We need to get into underlying assumptions. And to do that, we need to dig into the history of the organization. So Edgar Schein argues that as an organization is getting started in those very painful early entrepreneurial years, right, you're struggling to survive. And the ways of doing and being and acting of, of the founders that, that actually lead to success Right? Those become deeply ingrained in the culture of the organization. It's like, that's just the way we do things. Right? People kind of forget the original reason. Why did we do it that way? And it's fine. That's fine until the external environment changes. And then those ways may not make sense anymore. But you're not going to change them until you map them, until you see them and can talk about them. My friend Dave Gray has a, a culture map that's kind of built on some of Edgar Schein's ideas. Uh, it's a tool you can just get on, online for free if you want to start the process of mapping your organization's culture. Now, both Dave and Edgar would agree it's really hard to change a culture. Right? You don't want to, that's not really the place you want to start. Part of the reason it's hard is because double loop learning, this is an idea that was um, a term that was coined by Chris Argyris, double loop learning in organizations and individuals is extremely rare. So we're relatively willing to change our actions or our behaviors based on feedback. Right? We try something, it doesn't work, we try something a little different. Right? That, that first loop is pretty active but we're remarkably resistant to changing our beliefs based on feedback. We ignore it. We uh, come up with excuses and explanations. We, we don't even see what's going on. Now, I had my own experience with double loop learning back in 2005. I was writing ambient findability. I was consulting. We had young kids. I was under a certain amount of stress, and I started to suffer from severe chronic back pain. It was, it was terrible. So I went to the doctor and she checked me out and she said, well, uh, here you go, take three Advil three times a day and here's some physical therapy exercises for you to try. So I followed doctor's orders uh, and it didn't work. So in desperation, of course, I went to Google and I searched on back pain and stress. And I found this book, Healing Back Pain by Dr. John Sarno, in which he argues that much chronic pain is psychosomatic. And, and he actually explains the mechanisms through which this operates. And so what he's talking about is sort of a, 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 a kind of a conception of this, the mind-body connection. Now, at first, I was skeptical. I thought, who is this guy? Why should I trust him? Maybe he's just out to sell books. I actually had to read the book two or three times before I was able to fully believe what it was telling me. And once I did, my back was healed. Um, and my mind was changed. Right? The way that I look at Western medicine, my understanding of the mind-body connection, was radically changed. Now, once you start to see differently, there's no going back. Right? So, I am much more skeptical of Western medicine than I ever was before that experience. Um, if you want to go down this particular rabbit hole, um, Hippocrates' shadow is a wonderful guide um, to all the scary things about Western medicine. Um, Nassim Taleb puts it a little more simply and bluntly. Um, if you want to accelerate someone's death, give him a personal doctor. I don't mean provide him with a bad doctor. Just pay for him to choose his own. Any doctor will do. <laughs> he argues that our culture has a naive predisposition towards uh, intervention, right? Just do something, right? Give me some drugs, do some surgery, fix it. 
and we cause, in many cases, more damage um, than the original problem. Speaking of doctors, this is a photograph of Dr. Roger Bannister breaking the unbreakable barrier, right? running a mile in less than four minutes in 1954. There's a wonderful story about this, um, this feat. At the time, uh, there were three men, uh, this guy from the UK, guy from Australia, guy from the US, and they were all competing to break what had been called for, for, for a long time an unbreakable barrier. As I started reading this book, I, I thought, that's a weird coincidence, right? Why would there be three people in the world at exactly the same time that are all of a sudden you know, seconds away from breaking some unbreakable barrier. Well, as I read, I realized that this wasn't only or even primarily an athletic feat. It was also a testament to the power of science and information. This was a time when the scientific method was starting to take off and information was beginning to flow more freely all around the world. And so these athletes had access to what kinds of, what, what, what sorts of training, what kinds of nutrition actually work? And it's worth noting that it wasn't very long before this that athletes were having their spleens removed so that they could run faster. Right? This was an operation with zero efficacy and a one in five chance of death. Right? They were doing crazy stuff back then, right? Um, but because of the power of science and information, people were learning, and improving at a rapid rate. And that's been our story for the last few hundred years. But it's worth asking, at, at, at a moment in time when we are inundated with information, where information is everywhere, it's in the air, it's at our fingertips, have we passed an inflection point? Right? Um, are we making better decisions? Are we learning more effectively given all of this information? Or are we kind of going downhill? This brings us to the last chapter, uh, limits. And by the way, I've been assured by an expert on snails that this little guy can totally cross that gap. <laughs> so these are three of the most fascinating and utterly depressing books I've ever read. Okay? I recommend them highly but you've been warned. They, they all argue that we are living beyond our limits and we're beginning to feel the consequences, which raises the question, can we change course? Well, anyone who's familiar with Jared Diamond's uh, book, Collapse, knows that we humans are perfectly capable of, of sailing an entire civilization into an iceberg. So I'm not sure I'd say I'm an optimist, but I do have hope. I believe there are things we can do. For instance, there's this wonderful practice called river daylighting. So if you think about the period of time as our cities were being built up, right, we started polluting the rivers. So what did we do? We covered them up. We buried them. And that worked for quite a while, um, but eventually has led to increased urban flooding. So there are a growing number of cases where people have begun this process of bringing the rivers back to the surface. It begins with mapping. Right? People have forgotten those rivers are there. So folks begin by mapping the buried rivers, making the invisible visible. Then sometimes the same folks, sometimes another group, begins to paint a positive vision of, th of the future, of how things could be different, of how we might bring these rivers back to the surface. And there's a growing number of communities, um, Yonkers, New York, uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, where rivers have been brought back to the surface. And not only has it um, shown that, that you can get a positive return on investment because of the decreased flooding, um, but this leads to healthier and happier communities. Now, I think this is a wonderful practice in and of itself, but it's also a nice metaphor for the work that we do. Right? We need to uh, map what's hidden in our organizations and in our cultures so that we can affect positive change. 
So I'll tell one more story. Um, this year I've been working with um, the Baker Library at Harvard Business School. And one way to kind of frame this project is we've been working on making the invisible visible. Let me explain. The, the catalyst for this project was the recognition that they absolutely need to redesign their website. It's terrible. It hasn't really been changed in 12 years. Right? It's kind of an embarrassment. But to their credit, they realized if we frame this as a website redesign, we will have failed before we even begin. Because part of the problem is it's been viewed as a website that's separate to the organization. And they, and they understand that as the web becomes more an integral part of how we work, right, cross-channel user experiences, that we, we don't want to frame the project that way. So this was framed as more of, of an understanding and mapping and improving the whole ecosystem of Baker Library. And so we began with a series of ethnographic interviews with faculty and staff and students. And we asked them, how do you do research? We didn't focus on the library. We didn't focus on the web. We asked them, how do you do research? And the, the lessons that we learned, the insights that we gained, we, we then t turned into maps right, that, that helped to make the invisible visible so we could understand and begin to talk about what's going on and how can we affect change. We did it for faculty. We did it with the MBA students so we could understand what, what, are, the, what are the points in, in their kind of experience going through the business school uh, where we can affect the most positive change. Once we kind of got our arms around the ecosystem as a whole, we, begin to, we began to focus in on the website. And that's the work I've been doing the last couple of months. And we did some usability testing of that existing website. Um, and I have a, a story to tell um, about that uh, one particular test that, for me, um, was, was very meaningful. So I, did some, I ran some of these tests with the librarians. And I gave them a set of tasks See if you can complete this using the website. And, and they were able to do it very quickly, very easily. Right? And then I ran the same tests with MBA students. And there was this one student um, uh, who, and it was interesting to note, I actually had a little bit of time before the interview. These were remote WebEx sessions. And so I Googled her. I was like, OK, I want to know who I'm talking to. And this was a really impressive young lady. Right? Um, she wasn't at Harvard Business School by accident. Very accomplished, very smart. So we get into the interview, and I'm giving her these simple tasks. And she failed one after the other after the other. And she was getting increasingly frustrated. And she finally sort of needed to pause and just kind of vent and kind of explain the situation. And she said, you know, I've, I've, I, I, st I see the value in performing these tasks. I want to be able to do this. I want to know this. And I've actually been to the library several times since I got to school. And the librarians have been great. And they've helped me. They've told me how to do things. But I, I kind of forget. Right? And she said, part of the problem is that we're, we're in the middle of the library, which means we're trying to be quiet. So Harvard's got this beautiful reading room. right? And it's very, very quiet. The only people who are making any noise are the people who are the librarian and the person they're helping. And she said, I'm really self-conscious. I know we're disturbing people, and I'm having a hard time paying attention because I'm kind of worrying about the noise we're making. And she said, you know, she showed me how to do a few things, but I forgot them once I left. I'd really like to learn how to do this. Maybe I'm just a totally dumb user. Harvard Business School MBA student saying, I'm just dumb. Right? And she was feeling sad, and I was feeling a little sad as she's saying this. But another part of me was feeling really happy because fireworks were going off. I was thinking, we can make this better. right? And this is a perfect illustration of the need to think across channels. right? We can make the physical space better. So you can actually have a really quiet, private place to do the interview. We can change the way interviews are done so that 
the librarian's not showing you how to do it. The user has the control of the keyboard and the mouse, and they're actually doing it. So they've got some muscle memory of what actually happened. And you can record the session and then send follow-up links so that they can, when they get back to their, their room, um, or two months later, they can kind of run through it without having to remember everything. And of course, we can make the website better so that it's a lot harder to fail. Right? And so a lot less people think of themselves as dumb users. Okay, so I've been talking about maps. I want to give you just a little bit of homework. Um, this is a school after all, right? Um, so think of any system, right? Could be, could be the school, could be a place where you work, uh, any organization where you're involved, and map, map the system. Right? Doesn't need to be fancy, it can be back of a napkin, kind of pencil, sketch, whatever, but, but map the system. And then map the system outside the system, right? Map the broader context. And then share the map. Share it with a family member, with a colleague. Send it to me if you want. I'd be happy to take a look, right? The point is just get started with mapping and with making the invisible visible. So I want to start to wrap up here. I've always loved this quote by my friend Jorge Arango, where architects use forms and spaces to design environments for inhabitation. Information architects use nodes and links to create environments for understanding. Now, I would argue we are all information architects, and we are all in the understanding business. Now, to do this well, we need to employ some cognitive tools. We need a microscope so we can get down into the details and really understand what's going on. We need a telescope so we can look far and see the big picture. And we also need a kaleidoscope where we can keep tweaking the lens and seeing differently, seeing from a different perspective. Earlier this year, I decided it was about time I learned a little bit about traditional architecture. Right, given that I've been an information architect for 20 years. So I started doing my homework. Um, turns out there's a lot we can learn from the past. Right? Vitruvius totally nailed it when he argued that we need to aim for strength and utility and beauty. Right? It's not pick one or two. Right? We need to embrace the genius of the and. Now there's this lovely quote by Donlin Linden um, about the steps of Varanasi. Each step is a potential place, a place to worship, to wash, to sell, to sleep, a place to die and be burned. This is, I, I see this as, as sort of a wonderful inspiration for those of us who engage in acts of placemaking in physical and digital spaces. Right? Our places need to uh, serve many different kinds of people with many different tasks and purposes over long periods of time. And then there's Frank Lloyd Wright, who argued that no house should ever be on a hill or on anything. It should be of the hill, belonging to it. He was on a lifelong quest for what he called organic simplicity the synthesis of form and function that we can observe uh, if we see, for instance, and understand a flower in a field. So let me conclude with a note about libraries. Anyone who knows me knows that I love libraries. A library isn't just a place, a building, and it's never been just about books. It's not even just about information. The library is an act of inspiration architecture and a keystone of culture. Libraries are more important than we know. Libraries lift us up by reminding us of the amazing human capability to create and share knowledge and wisdom. And I would argue that the work that we do has the same potential. 
when we're engaged in acts of placemaking in digital and physical places, we have that same ability to lift people up right, and to serve as architects of understanding. It's not just about code. It's never just an interface because everything is deeply intertwingled. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> to be more precise, it's, it's a book about how everything is connected from code to culture. And it's organized into five chapters, um, nature, categories, connections, culture, and limits. And so is this talk. Now, before we dive in, I'd like to um, explain why I wrote this book in the first place. You see, a number of experiences in recent years had convinced me that while I believe that the information architecture of the polar bear book is more important and in many, many ways more difficult than ever before, it's, it's simply not enough. As the web becomes more intertwingled with the work um, that we do, uh, in, across physical and digital channels, we need to go deeper. We need to dig into difficult, messy issues like culture and governance. So that's why I wrote the book. And let me kind of tell, tell you about a few of these experiences that, that kind of convinced me we need to go deeper. Um, one was, was working uh, with Macy's.com out in San Francisco a few years back. And walking down the hall with our client. And he said, you know, we've, I've been here for quite some time. And every few years, so I wrote up a report, and I was brutally honest. I compared the Library of Congress's web presence to the Winchester Mystery House. Uh -oh. It's a well-known California mansion. Uh, it's in the uh, San Jose area. If you ever get a chance, I highly recommend a visit. It's one of the best tours I've ever had. Um, but the story of the house is that the widow who lived there had been told by a psychic that when the house was complete, she would die. And so she kept adding room after room after room for 38 years. Right? So by the end, there were hundreds and hundreds of rooms and staircases and doorways and windows um, and no blueprint. Now, when you visit, you find it's not an unattractive house, and the, 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 the view from any individual room is not unusual. But it's a findability nightmare. Right? It, it, you, it's very easy to get lost. And I argued this is the, the sort of the perfect metaphor for the Library of Congress's web presence. So I wrote in my report. I flew out to DC to, uh, to sort of have a series of meetings throughout the day with um, all the major departments of the library. Um, but upon arrival at the library, I was told that I would not be having a series of meetings because the report had been embargoed. <laughs> it had been deemed as too, it was going to upset too many people. So I, I did have a meeting with the chief information officer. And she said, you know, Peter, we, we agree with you, right? It, but, but we're going to upset people. It's not the right time. We got to kind of keep the lid on this. So, you know, naturally, I was disappointed. I went back to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I continued to work with the library on small projects, but I was frustrated, right? Um, we'd, we'd sort of seen this big problem, but we didn't have a path to a solution. Well, over the next several months, apparently this report percolated through the black market of the Library of Congress and uh, eventually made its way to the executive committee. Um, where at the highest level, they decided we need to change how we work on the web. And they formed a web governance board um, uh, with representatives from all of those major units. And they said, why don't we get that guy, Peter, who uh, pointed out all the problems to come back and see if he can help solve them. And so that was where uh, I, I had the opportunity to really uh, engage uh, in, in a kind of a rethinking of, of the library's web presence. And, and we made some real progress. I'm proud of the work that we did together over the period of about a year and a half. But we didn't go as far. We, we bring in some consultants to help us tidy up our mess, to clean up our website. And, and you know, they, they do a good job, but as soon as they leave, we start to mess it up all over again. 
Well, this kind of bothered me because it's not my goal in life uh, to uh, make superficial you know, uh, changes that are, that are ephemeral. I want to make lasting, sustainable change. Right? So it, to me, this kind of, you know, kind of raised the challenge. How do we kind of, you know, I don't want to skate along the surface, right? How do we get through some of those cracks in the ice and go deep? had a similar experience. Uh, I worked for a few years with the Library of Congress. And the length of the relationship is kind of surprising because it got off to a rather rocky start. I was, uh, I was asked to, to do an evaluation of the library's web presence. So I did my, you know, I did my user research, did my stakeholder interviews, and I started to take a look at the library's websites which proved to be a lot more difficult than you might expect because the Library of Congress had over 100 websites, all with different look and feel, different brand, identity, search and navigation systems, and of course users had absolutely no idea which site to visit for which purpose. Thank you for that, that great introduction and, and that warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here with you folks tonight to talk about the architecture of understanding. And I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I will um, just give you a kind of a brief, my version of, of my background briefly, uh, and then we'll dive right in. Uh, I have tweeted a link to, this, to these slides, uh, so uh, if you want to kind of feel a little bit less, less of a need to take notes, uh, this, the slides are there for you later. So, my academic background is in library and information science. I'm one of those crazy librarians who fell in love with the internet in the early 1990s. So most of my career has been spent outside the walls of the traditional library, helping a wide variety of organizations of all shapes and sizes with their information architecture and user experience challenges. Along the way, as you know, I've written a number of animal books, about polar bears and lemurs and butterflies. Um, and then there's my most recent creation, Intertwingled, which is a book about everything, or 